Anyone who's been on the set of a film knows that the unexpected is the one thing that can always be counted upon. Utilizing all kinds of technical equipment, wrangling actors and crew, and taking care of unforeseen problems is something all directors must deal with. Superstition is a very real feeling on the set of any film, but when the film deals with the supernatural, people are more sensitive than ever to unplanned accidents and coincidences that occur behind the scenes. The Shutter docuseries, Cursed Films, charts the tragic production of five classic horror films. Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights, a part of the Kings of Horror Network. I'm M.L. Miller. Before we begin, remember to give this video a like, share with your buddies across the electronic superhighway, click subscribe to this channel, and don't forget to ring that bell for notifications. Please get the word out to new folks so we can make this channel bigger and better. Releasing this week on Blu-ray, and DVD is the collected first season of Cursed Films, a five-part docuseries that premiered on Shudder a while back. Barring any paranormal intervention, I'm going to review each of the five half-hour installments that make up this collection. Let's get it on. Episode 1 looks at The Exorcist, the most iconic film of the bunch, and one that I feel is as scary today as it was when it shocked audiences around the world when it was first released. It is common knowledge William Friedkin and William Peter Blatty's smash hit was plagued with all sorts of mishaps, disasters, and accidents that befell the crew and cast. To this day, star Linda Blair doesn't talk much about her experiences on the set. Because the film was such a cultural phenomenon, I felt this segment had the least amount of new information to divulge. While this one did a good job of separating fact from urban myth, it doesn't really have much to add to what I already knew. As far as something new, the segment does follow a modern exorcist who gives his own experiences and actually allows the cameras in to watch one of his sessions with a patient. This edition really didn't add much to the legend of the exorcist film, but it does highlight the charlatan image that many exorcists often have. It was rough watching this poor and impressionable patient act out in sessions as if he were possessed with the exorcist chanting over him. At the end, the camera shows the patient shelling over a large amount of money to the exorcist and promising to come back next week for more exorcism. The segment went on too long and almost felt like filler to make this a half hour length. It highlights less about the film and more about how gullible people are to the powers of suggestion. Episode 2 is another popular and widely covered troubled production, The Omen. Once again, because the film deals with the devil's business, many in the religious and occult community warn the filmmakers to take caution for dabbling into dark territory. After two planes carrying star Gregory Peck and a producer were struck by lightning, another of Peck's planes crashing after he decided not to go on it, and the death of the FX guy's wife who was decapitated in a very similar manner as another character was in the movie occurred, people began believing in the warnings. Still, this episode delves into the possibility that because the film was made, was successful, and many avoided death despite what seems to be divine or not so divine interventions, the film might be blessed rather than cursed. With this second episode, a formula seems to be arising, as the real-life events that might suggest the film is cursed is presented at the top of the episode, while the second portion unravels much further from the film. In this case, the interview with the Omen director, Richard Donner, keeps the focus on the film a little longer than the previous episode, but there's still a descent into tertiary territories of Satanism, occult specialists, and black magic. I was especially entertained by the black magician who performs a ritual on an unnamed film on camera. I wish they would have had the balls to release the name of the film that he was cursing to see if the curse worked. While I respect all beliefs and the religions they choose to worship, I was distracted a bit by the black magician's strong resemblance to John C. Riley. 
I hope the black magician doesn't take offense to this, as I don't really want to be on the receiving end of a curse myself. This episode felt a bit deeper than episode 1, most likely because I was less aware of the behind-the-scenes accidents and coincidences that occurred during The Omen. Poltergeist takes center stage in the third episode of Cursed Films, most likely due to the fact that it deals with the real-life deaths of Heather O'Rourke, Dominique Dunn, Julian Beck, and Will Sampson. Instead of delving into mysticism and the occult, this episode chooses to try to dispel a lot of the tales of curses on the sets of the Poltergeist films, rather than support them. The film does a lot of acknowledgement and reverence towards the actors who had passed away, and presents their demises in a respectful manner. But it also does a great job of sticking to the facts. The rumor is that real skeletons were used during the filming of Poltergeist, and the ramifications of that desecration resulted in the deaths of the actors. While I won't spoil the validity of this rumor, as it's revealed in the latter portion of the episode, I will say that this is the most rational look at a problematic production so far in this series. Out of the first three, this is the one that I feel really offers up clarification to the rumors of curses, as well as honors the film and those who made it in a way that feels respectful. I preferred this less sensational take on the episode much more than the two previous ones that rely on unseen forces to explain the horrors that happen when the camera stopped rolling. Still, this episode also gives some backstory to the callous decisions by the studios to release Poltergeist 3 after O'Rourke's death, as they almost glamorize the tragedy in order to get butts in movie seats. While I doubt I'll be revisiting Poltergeist 3 anytime soon, this episode cements the fact that Poltergeist is a classic, and the sequel also contains some very chilling moments. I gotta rewatch those sometime soon. The fourth episode concerns a tragedy that I remember as if it occurred yesterday. The crow dropped just at the right time for me. The comic spoke to me as an emotional teen cinephile, and the tragedy surrounding both the creation of the comic, inspired by the death of the girlfriend of the Crow creator, James O'Barr, as well as the much-publicized death of the lead actor, Brandon Lee, during the filming, hit me as if I knew these people personally. The film itself is flawed, but still resonated as a bittersweet memory of all who had sacrificed themselves to make it. This episode centers on the tragedy of Lee's death, and some of the coincidences that link up with the death of his father, Bruce Lee. Much like the previous episode, the film serves as a tribute to Brandon Lee, his hard work on the film, and the potential that was wasted because of one misfired bullet. This episode targets in on the technical reasons why the round that was supposed to be a blank actually fired a real bullet. It also details the scenes that had to be changed, cut, and altered in order to finish the production including the complete erasure of the character of the cowboy, played by the Hills Have Eyes actor, Michael Berryman. It's really a treat seeing what Berryman has to say about his time with Lee and his thoughts about the film. I also was invested in the clarification the episode provides as the special effects department explains what went wrong. This episode is a wonderful tribute to the film and those who survived the production, filling in some of the mystery surrounding the troubled shoot. Finally, the last episode is the most tragic of them all, the chaos behind the filming of The Twilight Zone, the movie. This one is most tragic in that it seems like it could have been avoided. Most likely, you've seen the footage of Vic Morrow and the two children who were not supposed to be working at 2 a.m. in the morning perish because of lax safety measures taken while filming John Landis' segment of The Twilight Zone, the movie. Every time I see this clip fills me with utter dread, because one second, three human souls are on screen, and the next second, they're gone. This segment goes into the many events leading up to that fateful night, and talks with the effects men responsible for the safety of the shoot. While Landis himself doesn't appear in the episode, he isn't represented very kindly as the picture is painted that the young director ran a reckless set during the filming that only began with endangering the lives of the cast and crew by mixing explosions with a flying helicopter and live actors below. Hindsight is 2020, but this one seems like a no-brainer, and while of course no one wanted anything like this tragedy to happen, happen it did, and this episode really captures the true curse of the film, 
as it is a specter that hovers over all of those involved to this day. The importance of safety on the movie set is highlighted in this episode, not only by those who worked on the film, but also from stunt experts like Kane Hodder, who himself was scarred horribly from an effect that went wrong. We also visit the always entertaining Lloyd Kaufman on set, who talks about how safety is always the top concern in all of his trauma productions. While this episode ends the season on a somber and devastating note, it does convey the message that at the end of the day, it's only a movie, and life is always more precious than film. Cursed Films walks the fine line of honoring the tragedies that befell upon the sets of these movies and mystifying and almost glamorizing them. I feel documentary filmmaker Jay Cheel does a fantastic job of collecting a lot of information that slices through much of the rumors surrounding these films. It also proves to be quite deft in paying homage to those who have been scarred by doing work that has brought entertainment to so many. I never felt that the series was relishing in the carnage, but occasionally I got that weird feeling I get when I watch all of those cable serial killer documentaries that sort of glorify the killer while being thoughtless towards the victims. I don't think this is the fault of the filmmaker. It's just that any time real lives are lost due to either coincidence, accident, act of God, or sheer bad luck, the love I feel towards any film is tarnished a bit. With a new season of Cursed Films on the way in October, I'm curious as to what films they're going to cover, now that the big-name Cursed movies have all been dealt with. While Island of Dr. Moreau comes to mind, Lost Soul covered that one quite thoroughly, and I hope they don't try to retread it. I would love to see an episode done for The Evil Within, as I've heard quite a few horror stories behind that production. Maybe they'll cover some horror movies that were never released or finished, I can't wait to find out, as this season of Cursed Films is a winner. Anyone who is just as interested in the arduous and often tragic events that occur behind the camera as the horrors playing out in front of it is the target audience for this fascinating series. That'll be it for today. If you like this video, please pound the thumbs up button. Share this video with your social media addicted pals. If you're looking for written reviews, you can find them on mlmillerwrites.com. Don't forget about the new trade paperback of my comic book horror series, Grave Trancers. It's out in all of the finer comic shops on September 2nd. And be sure to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell for alerts to be the first to see my future videos. Thanks so much for your time, and take care. You're doomed to live the life you're meant to be Stuck inside your